When World War II broke out in September 1939, the German admiral in charge of U-boat operations, Admiral Karl Donitz, tried to put as many submarines at sea as possible to disrupt the flow of food and war materials to Britain. Now, um, at first, he was hampered in his efforts by the small number of German U-boats, only 56 when the war started, and by the distances they had to proceed in order to get to the western Atlantic sea lanes from their bases in Germany. Now, once uh, Norway and France had been conquered, however, the situation changed. While secondary bases of operation were established in Norway, Donitz personally supervised the construction of fortified submarine bases along the French Atlantic coast at Brest, Lorient, Saint-Nazaire, uh, La Paris, and Bordeaux. Forgive me if I've butchered those pronunciations. Now, submarines operating out of these bases could cut their transit times to the hunting grounds in the western Atlantic by half. Moreover, German submarine production was continually increasing. By July 1940, there were many more U-boats on station in the Atlantic at any given time than in the opening months of the war. Now, uh, because of a limited number of available escorts and a lack of any effective convoy operations, Allied losses to the U-boats began to mount rapidly. Admiral Donitz often used wolf pack tactics with as many as 20 or 30 U-boats coordinating their attacks. Often the targeted merchantmen were silhouetted by bright lights ashore all along the U.S. Atlantic seaboard. By the fall of 1940, German U-boats were sinking about 300,000 tons of Allied shipping per month. German successes were making such a dent into oil supplies that fuel rationing had to be imposed in the northeastern United States. Now, a uh, particularly difficult phase of the North Atlantic Sea War involved the uh, Allied convoys to the Russian port of Murmansk on the Barents Sea. During the German offensives into the Soviet Union in 1942 and 1943, Allied assistance to Soviet forces was slowed to a trickle. Sometimes less than 40% of a given convoy made it to Murmansk, but the perseverance of the Allied merchantmen and Allied escort ships finally broke Germany's efforts to destroy the convoys. Some historians believe that the supplies received through Murmansk were a decisive factor in preventing Russian surrender to the Germans during the war. President Roosevelt and uh, Prime Minister Churchill realized that little could be done against the Germans in Europe until the submarine menace had been brought under control in the Atlantic. Every effort was made to defeat the U-boats. By early 1941, enough escort vessels had been built so that most merchant vessels could be convoyed at least part of the way on each side of the Atlantic. Now, uh, in addition, an improved radar was developed that allowed convoy escort ships to detect and track surfaced U-boats. By May 1941, the German Kriegsmarine's code had been broken by British codebreakers, allowing the British to decipher Donitz's instructions to his wolf packs at sea and steer convoys away from them. Increasingly effective coastal air patrols inhibited U-boat operations off the U.S. Atlantic seaboard by late 1941, and in the Gulf of Mexico and off South America by 1942. British patrols uh, flying out of Iceland did the same for the Western approaches to Britain. Now, eventually, uh, all these efforts began to pay dividends. In 1940, 26 Allied vessels were sunk for every U-boat lost. By 1942, that ratio had been cut to 13 to 1. Now, this was still serious because by then the Germans were producing about 20 new U-boats per month, but the tide was turning. By 1943, with the addition of the uh, escort carrier and hunter-killer groups and sufficient numbers of escorts to accompany convoys all the way across the Atlantic, the rate of exchange had fallen to just two vessels lost for every U-boat sunk. Okay, thereafter, continued improvements in radio direction finding techniques and hunter-killer operations kept the U-boats pretty much under control and out of the Atlantic sea lanes until the war's end in 1945. After the liberation of France in 1944, most U-boats operated from bases in Norway. Toward the end of the war, U-boats fitted with breathing tubes that were called snorkels, which permitted them to operate diesel engines while submerged. They attempted a last blitz against Allied shipping in British waters. Some even patrolled once again in U.S. waters, but these efforts came too late to affect the outcome of the war. Notable among U.S. anti-submarine group exploits was an incident involving the submarine U-505 in June of 1944. She had been tracked from the time she left her base in Brest until she headed home northward from a cruise in the South Atlantic. With this information, Captain Dan Gallery and his group, led by the escort carrier Guadalcanal, intercepted U-505 and blasted her to the surface with depth charges and hedgehogs. The defeated crew set demolition charges and abandoned ship, but before the U-boat could sink, a specially trained American salvage party boarded it. 
They disconnected the demolition charges, closed the sea valves, and captured the U-boat and her entire crew. They then pumped out the waterlogged boat and towed her to Bermuda. After the war, the U-505 was restored and has since been on display at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, Illinois. Now, in all, the Allies lost 2,775 merchant ships, amounting to 23 million tons during the Battle of the Atlantic. Of this, 14.5 million tons were sunk by German U-boats. The Germans entered 1,175 U-boats into the war, of which they lost 781. They used the capital ships they had at the beginning of the war, and those completed during it, as independent surface raiders. Though they scored some notable successes, most of these were eventually hunted down by the Allies and sunk or blockaded in port.